Hello, and thank you for joining our Flame Detection Fundamentals presented by Relevant Solutions, Honeywell, and Conexus. You may know our company by Wilson Moore, but we have recently changed our name to reflect all of the critical service solutions that we are capable of providing. We have designed, built, and serviced fire and gas detection systems for over 50 years. Together, Relevant Solutions and Honeywell can evaluate and recommend replacements and or upgrades for your aging fire and gas detection systems. We also specialize in rotating equipment, purification, and thermal equipment. If you would like more information about any of our business units or products, please give us a call. Today, we have two different presenters, Charles Simic and Ed Marzal. Charles has a technical degree in electronics and began his career in fire and gas detection with the General Monitors, Inc. in February of 1988, and then he transitioned to sales and marketing in 1995. In November of 2000, he left General Monitors for a regional sales position at Fire Century Corp, FSC, until they were acquired by Honeywell in January of 2012. As a Honeywell employee, he assisted with the integration during the first year and then took on a marketing role as a product and technology specialist. He is responsible for Honeywell Analytics Optimal Flame and Gas Detection Equipment, and this is Charles' 28th year in the industry. Ed Marzal is the President and CEO of Conexus. He has over 20 years of experience in the design and instrumented safeguards such as SIS and fire and gas systems. Ed is an ISA Fellow and former director of the ISA Safety Division and author, author of Safety Integrity Level Selection Test Textbook from ISA. He is also a registered professional engineer and an ISA 84 expert. Just a few notes before we get started. If during the presentation you have any questions, please type them in the questions box on your GoTo sidebar. I will read aloud all of the questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any, uh, any other issues, including not being able to see or hear the presentation, please type your issue in the chat or questions bar, and I will work quickly to troubleshoot the issue. For those of you who are unsure who your account manager is or would like more general information, please send me an email and I will follow up with you as soon as possible. We are very excited that you have decided to join us today, and I'm now going to turn it over to Charles. Thank you, Alyssa, for that introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the fundamentals of flame detection. Um, specifically, we're going to present the electro-optical spectrum in a single slide. We're going to go over the spectral output of a typical gasoline fire and what a hydrogen fire looks like. And then we're going to look at the sensors that are used to detect the energy that's emitted by those types of fires, specifically in the ultraviolet, the visible, and the infrared spectrum. Um, after that, we're going to show you how sensor arrays are, are formed, how we take individual sensors and, and make arrays and develop different products for different applications. Having said all of that, um, I'm going to try and take the science out of this as much as possible and make it uh, easy for everyone to understand. So the electro-optical spectrum consists of all the wavelengths of radiant energy, which think of it as light. The green portion that you see, that's the visible spectrum. That's what the human eye can detect. Shorter wavelengths will be on the left-hand side. These are typically ultraviolet. Uh, and there are cosmic rays and x-rays and y-rays and gamma rays that are further out. But we, we look into the ultraviolet spectrum when we look at uh, fires on some of our products. Uh, the immediate region just to the right is a region known as the near-infrared region, and that's because it's very close to the visible spectrum. Then we have shortwave infrared, which spans about 1 to 3 microns, and then midwave infrared, which is about 3 to 5 microns, and then um, 5 out to about 12 microns. We have long, long wave IR, um, but we don't do very much in this region. And then the last region, the fifth region that science specifies, is called a very long wave region of the infrared spectrum. We, it has no practical application when we talk about optical fire detection, so we're not going to even present it here. So having said all of that, this is the spectral output of what a typical gasoline fire might look like. Okay? I've superimposed the electro-optical spectrum along the bottom edge so that we know where the specific regions line up. Um, uh, on this graph is also indicated the byproducts of combustion from a typical gasoline fire. So we're going to have oxides of hydrogen, which are going to manifest themselves as H2O. Uh, as a hot vapor, so it's going to be water vapor. 
Uh, and then we're going to have some oxides of carbon, which are CO2, carbon dioxide, and then carbon monoxide. And they have different spectral wavelengths. Anytime you burn anything in our atmosphere, it is made up of 90 or 77 percent nitrogen. And so we're going to have oxides of nitrogen as well. And they have a, a, an emission that's, that's out further beyond 5.5. When we look at a hydrogen fire, we have a much different looking model. Okay, the the single byproduct of combustion for hydrogen is H2O. We don't uh, create carbon components. We don't. Uh, we do create nitrogen components because we're burning hydrogen in the atmosphere, but we don't have the same type of uh, burn characteristics with hydrogen that we do with a typical hydrogen or a hydrocarbon fire like gasoline. So when we look at the different spectra, we consider first the ultraviolet, since it's further to the left, the shortest wavelengths. We use something called a UV phototube. Um, and typically, this is just a, a tube that's made out of a transparent material. It's not glass, because it needs to allow the transmission of ultraviolet particles. It needs to allow those particles to pass through. Um, inside the, the transparent material is captured a, a a, a gas that will ionize in the presence of ultraviolet energy, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Additionally, we have a cathode plate and an anode electrode, and these are what we're going to be using to measure the ionization that occurs. So what happens is we have a UV particle that passes through the outer material, and while it's on the inside of the tube, it's going to ionize. Basically, the UV particle is going to strike one of the molecules of gas, and it's going to eject what's called an electron, leaving an ion in its wake. So you have a positively charged ion and an electron. The electron is going to be attracted to the anode, which is positively charged because the electron is neg negatively charged. And so on its way to the anode, it's going to run into more gas molecules. That's going to cause further ionization, in other words, more electrons are going to be released from those molecules and we're going to have an avalanche effect of molecules headed towards the anode. Um, this is called the Townsend avalanche phenomenon. Uh, as these electrons are separating from the gas molecule, the positive particles that are left in their wake are ions and they're positively charged and so they're going to make their way to the cathode. And so what we end up with across the cathode and the anode is we get a current pulse. That pulse can be measured if we put a resistor between the anode and the electrode. We can measure the current going through the resistor and um, basically tell how frequent this current is, is, current pulse is occurring. The frequency with which the current pulse occurs is going to be proportional to the amount of UV that's present. In other words, the more UV we have, the higher the frequency of this pulse is going to be. And so on a gasoline fire, this is the region that we're going to be detecting with this particular UV phototube. If we look at that same region on the uh, hydrogen uh, fire, a uh, little different, but um, similarly, it's, it's that same region that we're, we're monitoring in the UV spectrum. So we move to the visible spectrum, and we use a, a different sensor. It's called a photodiode. Now, a photodiode, uh, in its benign state, in other words, when there's no light that's present, it's going to conduct some minimal amount of current flow. And we use this uh, minimal amount of current flow in a benign state to make sure that the, the sensor is actually functioning properly. A dead photodiode sensor is not going to conduct, and then we, therefore we can actually cause the unit to generate a fault based on that non-performance by that photodiode. In the presence of light, though, if we filter this properly, um, <clears throat> we're going to get uh, more current passing through this diode. The more light that's absorbed by the photoconductor, the more current that's going to pass. And we'll put up, again, we'll put a resistor in parallel with this device so that we can measure the amount of visible energy that we're seeing. Okay. This is the region of, of visible energy that's going to occur with a typical gasoline fire. And similarly, a uh, little bit lower, but uh, in the same spectrum, uh, this is the amount of visible energy we're going to see with a hydrogen fire. 
when we talk about the near infrared or the, the infrared region, we break this up into three separate regions. We talked about near infrared, which was that yellow portion that's very close to the green on our electro-optical spectrum. Um, and it usually spans about 0.7 to 1 microns. We look at that orange section, which is 1 to 3 microns. That's our, our first short wave IR region. And then we have a mid-wave IR region, which was, was uh, a redder color. Um, so you had yellow, orange, and then red. Um, and we use different sensors to, to look into these regions. Okay. We use the same sensor that we use on the visible detector to look at the near-infrared energy. We just filter it just a little bit differently. Okay. Um, when we look at the other infrared spectrum, we go with a different sensor. We go with what's called a lead sulfide or PBS sensor, which is very sensitive to broad spectrums of IR energy. We also use a lead selenide sensor, which is not as sensitive, but it is sensitive to IR energy, but it operates with higher temperature limits. And so we can get away with higher temperature applications using that particular device. So when we filter the photodiode so that we're looking at that near-infrared energy, this is the region that we're going to monitor. Okay? Uh, and it's that region that's very close to the visible spectrum. When we look at it in a hydrogen fire, we don't get a lot of this energy. And so there's not a lot, um, there's not a lot that this sensor is actually doing for us with a hydrogen fire. When we look at the lead sulfide and the lead selenide devices, since they're very, very similar, I can use one slide to, uh, to represent them. These are high-speed photoconductors, uh, generally military-grade sensors. And how they work is a single IR particle is going to travel in a straight line. And when it strikes the sensor, it's going to eject a single electron from the sensor. So one IR photon in, one electron out into our sensor circuit. As more IR particles come in contact with the surface of our sensor, we're going to have more electrons that get produced. Fires emit extremely large amounts of infrared energy. So we're going to have lots of IR particles and lots of electrons put into our circuit for analysis. And these are the regions that we uh, actually monitor. Now, because these sensors typically go into hazardous areas, we have to put them behind a material that's going to withstand uh, uh, explosions, let's say. Uh, so we use four types of material. We use an industrial grade quartz. We use a polypropylene, we use an industrial grade sapphire, and then we also use tempered glass. Each has its unique application for specific sensor arrays that we're going to get into a little bit later. The industrial quartz and the polypropylene allow the transmission of infrared energy from about one micron out to about three and a half microns. And we call this a wideband detection region because we're looking at a broad spectrum of energy. If we move down, we have, uh, uh, <clears throat> we have two different wideband regions that we look at. Um, we still use that same PBS sensor to look at the orange region, but then we're going to use the, that PBSE sensor, that lead selenide sensor, to look at the red region, which is our second wideband region. Now, when we're using tempered glass, the only one we can see is the one that's in the lower left corner. We can't see the one that's in the upper or the lower right corner because tempered glass, which is made of silicon, does not allow those longer wavelengths of infrared to transmit through the uh, transparent material. But if we go with an industrial grade sapphire, now we can look at both infrared regions simultaneously. These are the same graphs, only we're putting them uh, up with the, the hydrogen uh, spectral output. Uh, so you can see that the bulk of the energy that we're looking at in the wideband region comes from the orange section. On the lower two graphs, um, the red adds about 30-35% more energy, but the bulk of the energy is still in that orange um, shortwave IR region. So this is going to bring us to sensor arrays. Now that we've, we've talked about UV sensors and visible sensors and near-band and wide-band sensors, now we can 
actually combine them and actually generate different products for various applications. We have a UV only sensor and that's for a product that we call the SS4. That particular version is the AUV2. We also have UV visible and IR that we use on the SS3. Uh, our most popular product that we've sold over time, we have about 100,000 of these installed worldwide, is the dual UV visible and IR sensor. Um, our later products uh, encompass uh, UV Viz Dual IR, the FS20X, that's our latest generation product. We also have another product, uh, the FS17X, that uses visible and dual IR. A couple of uh, previous generation products, the FS7 and the FS10, also use that same sensor array platform. And then finally, we have our FS24X, which is our visible plus triple infrared sensor, which is primarily for uh, heavy petrochemical applications. Okay, so when we look at different sensor arrays, the UV only, this is what we're seeing with respect to the gasoline fire and the hydrogen fire. We're, we're getting that uh, uh, good solid signal in the ultraviolet spectrum. When we look at the SS3, which is a UV Viz IR sensor, we're looking at the bulk of the energy that comes from a fire. Uh, whether it's a, a, a hydrocarbon fire or a gasoline fire on the left, or the hydrogen fire, which is the one that's on the right. Uh, so this particular detector, both of these detectors are suitable for hydrocarbon and non-hydrocarbon fire applications. When we combine the dual UV Viz and IR, uh, the shapes of these are, are identical to the SS3, but we're getting a, a much wider field of view because we're using two ultraviolet phototubes. And so we'll, we'll get a 120 degree field of view out of the sensors on the, on the top there. But again, you can see that we are looking at both hydrocarbon and non-hydrocarbon fires. Uh, coming to the FS20X, which is one of our flagship products, what we do is we extract out the near infrared region because we found some uh, components there that are good for false alarm rejection. And so we, we use the near band and the visible combined with the visible band to tell us what's going on with the, the greater wide band region to give us a, a, a detector that is pretty robust against false alarm sources. And then that'll bring us to the, the Viz dual IR products that we have. Uh, the ones up on top are listed, the FS17X and the FS7, they have a bit different spectral response because they're contained within a polypropylene enclosure. And so they're looking through polypropylene, which allows a greater transmission of infrared energy. And so they're looking at a bit more infrared signal. But again, both products are suitable for hydrocarbon and non-hydrocarbon fires. The FS10R, which is primarily developed for the finishing industry, if you think of a, a, a liquid paint spray booth or an electrostatic powder coating booth, that's what the FS10R is designed for. And uh, again, very similar to the top, except a, a little bit narrower uh, wideband infrared region. It's just 1 to, one to 3 instead of 1 to 3.5, uh, like the, the units up on top. But again, still very suitable for hydrocarbon and non-hydrocarbon fires. And then finally that brings us to the triple IR detector which is uh, suitable for all fires. We've got, um, uh, a, we're looking at uh, most of the fire's energy, uh, almost 90 percent of the fire's energy using the, the FS24X with its different uh, region spectral sensitivities. Uh, and the philosophy is if you look at more information, you can make a more intelligent choice as to whether the energy that you're looking at comes from a real fire or a non-fire source. Oops, I go backwards. And that concludes, that's just the fundamentals of fire detection. Later on, I can talk about, um, on future dates, I can talk about how uh, we package these for inputs and outputs and, and the various uh, applications that they go into. So I'll turn it back over to Alyssa for now. All right, I'm going to go ahead and switch it back to Ed. Ed, you're going to be unmuted and you can begin as soon as you get control. All right. Uh, and I 
think, and as soon as I thought I had it set up, it has reverted back to its original state. Uh, Display settings and duplicate slideshow. Ah, there we go. Very good. There we go. That's much better. All right. Well, uh, we had a uh, good discussion about how optical fire detectors work. I am absolutely uh, fascinated by the topic, and I thank Charles for the discussion. Uh, and it, th there's a whole lot more to learn. I'm, I'm sure in, in future dates we'll, uh, we'll learn a lot more. But uh, even things like the fact that different parts of the fire are going to emit different uh, types of radiation. So uh, at the base of the fire, you're going to get more of a cracking reaction that's going to throw out more UV, whereas the top of the fire uh, is going to be generating something called radiative cooling, uh, which is throwing out those IR photons. So uh, very fascinating topic. But uh, what I'm going to discuss, uh, instead of the mechanism of how to detect that the fire is occurring, is making the determination of how many of these fire detectors do I need? Where do they need to be located and why? Uh, I'm going to go through this presentation relatively quickly. Um, and uh, bear with me for a second. Uh, if you need more information, this same presentation, uh, there's about two hours worth of it up at the Conexus YouTube site. So uh, let me just hit the high points here. In terms of fire and gas systems, all safety critical equipment needs a basis of safety. So how many do I need? Where do they need to be located? How frequently do they need to be tested? What type of redundancy do they need? You need some sort of engineering program to make that happen. Uh, and there are prescriptive methods like the NFPA standards, and there are risk-based methods such as what is in the ISA 84.007 uh, .00.07 technical report. Uh, if you look at that technical report, and uh, the folks at Conexus were kind of instrumental in developing it, uh, it contains a life cycle that will help you to make all of the decisions that you need about your fire and gas system. Uh, the life cycle that you're seeing on this slide here is representative of the original 2010 version of the standard, which really looked a lot more like quantitative risk analysis. That life cycle has been or is being updated in the new version of the technical report, which we expect to be released this year, uh, to look more like a traditional project flow. So going through each of the items kind of one at a time, uh, you start with identifying the requirements for your fire and gas system. So how do you know that you would even want to uh, go through some sort of engineering study that tells you how many detectors you would need and where they need to be located. Well, in a lot of cases, that recommendation is going to come to you from a risk study like a HAZOP or a LOPA. Uh, but in some cases, it's dictated by either government, corporate standards, or insurance providers. The next step in the life cycle is to develop a philosophy for how you're going to design your fire and gas systems. And that philosophy is going to include a lot of standard information about uh, how to perform engineering tasks. And it's also going to contain uh, just basic design rules of thumb. So uh, what set points am I going to use? What colors? What tones? How many manu manual activation points? And so on. Once your philosophy has been completed, the next step is to deter determine your requirements. Uh, basically, what are the performance targets that I'm going to design my system to? This is one of those things that's new with the 84.00.07 technical report. Previously, uh, people, people have always had fire and gas system philosophies, but it wasn't really until the late 2000s uh, that people started putting performance targets on how well they want their fire and gas systems to work. So when you pick a performance target for how good your system needs to work, there are two two general categories. We're going to use either a semi-quantitative approach, kind of you know, roughly 
do I need? That is what most people use. Uh, and then there's also use of a detailed quantitative risk analysis. Now, when I say performance targets, uh, the next question is, well, what, what do you mean by performance targets? If you want to define how well a fire and gas system works, you need to know two things, the coverage and the probability of failure. Probability of failure, a lot of you are already familiar with because it's what you do for any other safety instrumented system. It's the SIL, the probability of failure on demand. You look at the uh, different devices, their failure rates and the test intervals, and you could calculate what is the probability that the device is in a failed state. The other metric that is new as of that 2010 technical report is something called coverage. Uh, and if you look at the picture here, uh, you've got kind of a wireframe view of a well bay in an offshore platform with one optical fire detector and the yellow patch with the shadows from the wellheads represents uh, anything that is in yellow is an area that that fire detector can see. And we want to make sure that that area that the fire detector can see meets our performance targets. Okay, so I'm going to start out by explaining the fully quantitative approach very brief, briefly uh, because you're not going to understand the semi-quantitative approach until you understand the fully quantitative approach. So with the fully quantitative approach, we are going to model all of the things that can go wrong in your process plant. So for every piece of equipment, there's a possibility that that piece of equipment could leak. And if it does, we need to know how big the leak is going to be by doing dispersion modeling and release source term modeling. Uh, we're going to run other consequence models to figure out jet fire sizes, pool fire sizes, and vapor cloud explosions. And that's on the consequence side. We also need to know the release frequency, which is information that we can generally get out of a database. And then other factors that determine the risk, like probability of ignition and probability of occupancy. All of that information is going to go into our calculation of what we call scenario coverage. Once we have figured that out, we put all of that information into a tool that we call an event tree. And that event tree basically looks at, for each release, what are the probabilities of ignition, of coverage, of detection, of occupancy, and all those numbers uh, factor into a range of different outcomes that are possible. In this case, I've shown five different outcomes. And then for each one of those outcomes, what is the consequence in terms of life safety? We then sum up all of the things that can go wrong and compare it against a performance target. So many of you that are familiar with LOPA know that a common performance target is one in 10,000 chance per year of fatality. So if you look at the calculation in this event tree, you'll see that we've calculated that there's a 3.8 times 10 to the minus 4 chance of fatality in this zone with no fire and gas system, which is unacceptable. It needs to be less than 1 times 10 to the minus 4. So what we need to do is the blue shaded areas being the detector coverage and the detector availability we need to then modify those numbers until we do achieve the performance tar target. So that's how the performance targets of coverage and safety availability or the probability of success are determined in a fully quantitative approach. As you can imagine, the fully quantitative approach sounds very time-consuming, laborious, and requiring of a lot of advanced skills and sophisticated and expensive tools, and it most certainly is, which is why most people don't do it. Instead, they use a semi-quantitative approach where you take those risk factors, seven in all, that include likelihood based on equipment type, uh, factors that affect conf uh, consequence like temperature, pressure, and composition of the release material, and mitigating factors like occupancy and degree of confinement. And instead of putting a number on those factors, you pick 
categories the same way you would out of any HAZOP matrix. You don't pick an exact number, you pick a general category. So uh, once you pick those categories, it will result in a grade. So the grades that are common include uh, A, B, and C, with A being a high-risk area, like a high-pressor gas compression module, uh, a medium-risk area, which would be something like a well bay, and a low-risk area that might be something like uh, atmospheric uh, diesel or methanol storage. And for each one of those grades, you have different coverage set points. And this process takes roughly uh, one one-hundredth of the amount of time uh, that quantitative risk analysis does. And examples of how to do this are included in the Conexus Fire and Gas Engineering Handbook. And also, ISA just released a new book called uh, the let me see here, Performance-Based Fire and Gas System Engineering Handbook, which it, the, the, the folks here at Conexus wrote that book. So it's another uh, good source of information for coming up with some of these semi-quantitative approaches. Now, why would anyone uh, ever do something fully quantitative when they could do semi-quantitative? And how do I believe that this semi-quantitative approach is going to work? Well, the semi-quantitative approach works because we have calibrated it. And what that means is we've done process plants using both the fully quantitative and the semi-quantitative approach, and we adjust all those performance-shaping factors until both methodologies achieve the same results. And the uh, methods that I've discussed in the handbooks that are available have been calibrated against uh, offshore oil and gas, onshore oil and gas, and refining applications. So once I define a performance target, what does it apply to? Well, the answer is it applies similarly to electrical area classification. I take a look at all of the leak sources that are in my plant, and then I'm going to draw envelopes around them the same way that you draw envelopes for electrical area classification around leak sources. And that assigns the amount of coverage or the grade that's required for each of those areas. After I've assigned those performance targets, the next step is to go on <coughs> excuse me, and verify that I've achieved those coverage targets. And if you look at the technical report, it defines two different types of coverage. Geographic, which is essentially a fraction of a geographic area, which is generally what you use for fire detection coverage. And then also scenario coverage, which is a fraction of the number of release scenarios or, or the fraction of the gas clouds that can be detected by your gas detection system. So how do we do this? Well, uh, people have attempted to do this for many years using a wide variety of tools, the most uh, archaic of which would be taking the vendor's cone of vision drawing, scaling it to the same scale as your plot plan, and tracing it onto your plot plan to try to eyeball a coverage target. At this point in time, uh, there are several uh, very sophisticated computer modeling tools that do a much better job. And uh, the Conexus tool is a software application called Effigy to perform this task. So all the screenshots you're, you're going to see here come out of our Effigy tool. The first step is to define the performance of a particular uh, make and model of equipment items. So we could select, for instance, a Honeywell FS24X detector and select the performance parameters, including what type of fire am I trying to, to detect, uh, how big of a fire am I trying to detect, and what are the settings, high, medium, or low, on the device. And the software will calculate what the cone of vision is fully in three dimension for that device. And the information to do that characterization comes directly from the FM3260 approval, approval testing that these devices go through. 
And then we take the cone of vision that a fire detector can see, and then we're going to overlay that on top of a 3D representation of the plant that's either directly input from a CAD application, or you can build it yourself inside the software. The result is going to look like this. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a fire detector coverage map. Uh, this is a little... This picture is actually a little bit cropped. The blue boxes represent where the detectors are located. And on the, the, the ground, areas that are in green are going to be detected by two or more fire detectors. Areas that are yellow are only going to be detected by one detector. And areas that are red are detected by no detectors. So based on this uh, this type of graph, we would then calculate, well, what fraction of our covered areas are detected and compare that against the performance target. On the right-hand side, uh, you'll see a scenario coverage map, which is more appropriate for gas detection, where the different colors represent the frequency at which a gas cloud will exist in a given location that is not detected by the gas detection system. And the other output of that analysis would be the, the percentage of all of the releases that were detected, which is the performance metric that you're trying to uh, determine and base your number of detectors and their locations on. After we determine the, that the coverage has been achieved, the next part is safety availability. Safety availability, I'm not going to belabor. That is safety integrity level calculation, which there are many sources of information on how to do that. Uh, after we calculate that we've determined our appropriate safety availability, we will prepare specifications that define the behavior of your fire and gas system, kind of a safety requirements spec for uh, fire and gas detection. And then after that, the balance of the slides I'm going to shoot through really quickly because it's just basic instrumentation and control engineering. Do your detailed design, including loop sheets, all the way through PLC programming. Develop procedures for how you're going to interact with your fire and gas system, starting it, stopping it, testing it. Build it, load up your software, connect the wiring, and before you actually put oil in, uh, you're going to want to do some st sort of site acceptance test to make sure that everything works. And the tricky part about site acceptance testing for fire and gas systems is you not only have to have the equipment, the equipment has to be in the right spot and oriented in the correct direction. And then finally, you have an operation and maintenance phase where hopefully you've spent a lot of effort designing a perfect fire and gas system which will never activate because you never have a leak. And then, of course, there's also a management of change component. If anything about the risk profile of the plant or the equipment changes, you need to follow your appropriate management of change procedures to make sure that your performance targets are still appropriate and still have been appropriately achieved. And with that, I will go ahead and turn the uh, discussion back over to Alyssa. And uh, I expect at this point in time, somebody will have some questions that we will need to answer. I think I've done, turned it over to Alyssa. I am here. Okay. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so I'm looking at the questions. It doesn't look like we have any. We'll hang on for just a few more minutes. Let's see. Still no questions. 
Well, actually, uh, while people are typing or thinking about their questions, uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind asking Charles a question if uh, uh, to give a little bit of time to allow the attendees to uh, type some stuff in, if that's all right. Sure, sure. So, Charles. Uh, what I saw was uh, you showed some uh, spectral graphs for uh, hydrogen and for gasoline. Uh, tell me about uh, some of the other fires that might be out there and how that's going to affect the spectral uh, output. So uh, is a gasoline fire different from a diesel fire, from a methanol fire? How, how do they change? Charles, you're still there with us? Charles, are you still there with us? Mike. Okay, he should be squared. Can you hear me? Yes, there we okay. are. Yeah, this <laughs> is Mike. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to get trying to reach Charles right now via IM. So if there's any other questions, please uh, go through. Okay. Okay. Uh, looks like he might have run into some difficulties here. I'll try to explain it. Uh, Charles is much more uh, much more <clears throat> relevant to the product line. Uh, when it comes down to different flames, basically what it comes down to is that spectrums that he was showing uh, that that would uh, it basically shifts within the the near band, the wide band, as well as the visible, as far as the the amount of energy that is uh, produced. Does that help you out? Yes, absolutely. And I, I, I guess w would that mean that, uh, or uh, let me ask this, the wider the spectrum your detector can see, does that increase the uh, effectiveness of your detector in seeing other types of fires? Well, the, vis the, the, the spectrum itself of light is standard across the board. So it's where those peaks and valleys come into play. Uh, so that's why we do wideband, uh, why we do the different criteria that uh, Charles had mentioned earlier. Uh, and so we can build the characteristics around, uh, around those set points. I apologize, I had to step away. <laughs> that's okay, I think I covered you there. Thank you, Mike. So. Uh, his question was, with the different styles of flames, uh, the, the, how does the detector actually up, uh, determine those factors? Yeah, it's all software algorithms. We look, at the, we look at the signatures that come off of the sensor arrays, and we analyze them and compare them with what we know. We have a library of over 15,000 fire picks, which are pictures of what fire, those spectral outputs that we showed you. We have a, a library of over 15,000 of those. Okay. And so we know, we, and that's, our, that's what we use as a base when we're developing algorithms. And it's not just fires. We're looking at um, non-fire sources that would mimic fire because we want to make sure that we don't alarm to a non-fire source. Okay, very good. Okay, any other questions out there? It doesn't look like we have any, so if um, you guys are okay, we'll go ahead. Oh. Um, if it says industrial sapphire and tempered glass would give you similar readings, what would you use either one for? Okay, so tempered glass 
we can only look at that first region of wideband IR. And so that first region of wideband IR, when we're looking at fires that come within the finishing industry, such as liquid powder, sorry, electrostatic powder or liquid paint spray, that's where it has its benefits. We're not going to get a lot of that that longer wavelength stuff. But when we go into a refinery or when we go into an offshore platform that's drilling for oil or drilling for natural gas, we need those longer wavelengths because those those uh, when crude oil burns, it emits lots of copious smoke and also very, very strong infrared signals. And so we need those longer infrared signals in order to, to manage the detection properly. I hope that answers the question. I think it does. That is diagnostic only done with visible light? No, no, we use near band also. I, I am assuming that you're talking about false alarm rejection diagnostics. We, what we do is we look at we look at the energy, the total energy that comes from the fire, and we look at what's going on in the visible spectrum and the near infrared spectrum to determine if those values line up with what a real fire is supposed to look like. If your near band is too, if that ratio is too high, then we can reject because we know that real fires don't do that. Same thing with the visible. If the visible energy is, is too high when we compare it to the amount of infrared or ultraviolet that we're seeing, we know that that's not indicative of what a real fire is, is doing. Does dual and triple UV or IR mean redundancy slash availability in any way? Uh, the dual UV is not a true redundant. Um, and neither is the dual IR. Um, the dual IR on the FS20X, let's say, is actually two separate infrared regions. We're looking at the near band and we're looking at the wide band. When we talk about dual UV on the SS4 or the SS2, which is dual UV, visible, and IR, it's physically two separate photo tubes but we place them in such a way so that we can maximize the field of view. They're there to increase the amount of field of view, not to, to duplicate the detection, so to speak. Okay. Let's see. I think that's going to do it. Alyssa, once again, thank you for this opportunity. Ed, I enjoyed your presentation. All right, Wait, thank you. More. I appreciate the opportunity <laughs> also. <laughs> um, one more? The last, one more question that just popped up says, are these latest models affected by dew point and other natural phenomena like the old one? Okay. So um, when we talk about, and we're talking about moisture, um, when we talk about being in a coastal region or an offshore area, we're going to have an inversion layer. And typically, that's going to allow the atmosphere to contain large amounts of water or moisture in the form of fog and mist. If you walk onto an industrial facility, uh, one of the things that you're going to see is, is a relief valve automatically releasing steam into the environment. Okay? Typically, what happens when we deal with short wavelength signals is if the fire is between, sorry, if the, the, the fog and the mist or the steam is between the fire and the detector, much of that energy gets blocked and doesn't make it to the detector, and sometimes that fire goes undetected. One of the nice things about wideband IR is that we're looking at a broad spectrum of energy, and so more of that energy is allowed to get through such that we can still do reliably do flame detection in the presence of up to 70% obscuration even with moisture. Okay, uh, next question says, does fire and gas mapping usually reduce or increase number of detectors needed compared to old methods? Is it even noticeable to make it a rule? Uh, that's an interesting question. I've seen it go both ways and it depends on what the original design of the plant was. Uh, so. I, it, 
it's it, it's it's hard to say without uh, actually looking at the plants. Uh, it's, thus far, I usually have seen a slight increase in the number of gas detectors, uh, but generally there's a little bit of uh, excess in terms of the amount of fire detectors that are required. So it's 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 really hard to to make a general rule because it depends on uh, the original design, and the original designs uh, at this point in time are all still mainly. Uh, I don't want to call them wild guesses, but uh, engineering judgment rule of thumb based designs, and they're going to vary wildly depending on whose thumb the rule was based after. And the next question says, does Connexus work closely with vendors such as Honeywell, for example, or relevant solutions? Absolutely. Uh, we, I, I don't want to put a, a specific number on it, but a very large portion of what we do uh, doesn't even have our name on it. Uh, it uh, just goes out through engineering companies and equipment vendors. Okay, and I guess we'll give a few more minutes for any other questions that come through. Does prescriptive methods address fire and gas mapping in process areas? Yes, that's that. That's mainly the driver. Is is process areas? Uh, if you're looking to put fire detection or smoke detection in an occupied building, then the NFPA standards are going to have prescriptive rules for you to follow. Uh, but when you move out into process areas, that's when you need uh, something, uh, another approach to use. Uh, because the, the NFPA 72 rules aren't going to apply uh, in an open air plant and they, they don't discuss gas detection at all. So uh, it's in those process areas that the ISA 84.00.07 approach starts to make a lot of sense. And if your fire hazards are mainly hydrocarbon in nature, then the semi-quantitative approaches that uh, there are resources out that describe them uh, are going to be a good fit for those applications. And just to add to that, Ed, I mean, that's a very good, um, when we deal with NFPA code, NFPA is very good at protecting that people space, but when we get into that space that's not covered uh, or that's not uh, considered a, a people space, it's more of a process space, that's where the ISA code is going to come in and be more pre more relevant. Absolutely. All right, and the last question it looks like says, to both Connexus and Honeywell, is there any indication, even if subtle, that wireless will have a place in fire and gas detection? Yes. <laughs> uh, I agree also. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I could elaborate what? a little bit more, the 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 problem, and, and this is based on my background in SIS engineering as opposed to fire and gas, wireless communications can be very, very safe because the di the, you can diagnose that a wireless communication has failed very easily. The thing that's going to slow down adoption is people's uh, consideration of nuisance trip factors because if you lose communication with your detector then the SIS rules are going to tell you well that's a vote to trip and I have to take the safety action so from a safety perspective not an issue whatsoever it's just what is it going to take for me to get comfortable that I'm not going to get nuisance trips that are activating my dry chemical systems and my sprinkler systems all the time? That's the bar that's going to be difficult to cross as opposed to the safety bar. Honeywell already offers uh, somewhat uh, some wireless solutions. We don't have it for flame detection yet, but we do have uh, a, a line of gas detectors that uh, uh, utilize wireless technology. And I, I'm sorry, if I, if I could add one more point in, one of the advantages of using some uh, 
cap wireless capabilities for fire and gas is that that makes your system more survivable. So if there's an explosion that cuts a bunch of instrument cables, there's a chance that if your detector wasn't destroyed by that explosion, it will still be able to communicate with the control system even though your trunk lines of instrument cabling have been severed. So it's, it's, it's another tool in the arsenal for survivability in addition to safety. Yeah, I do want to add one point. This is Mike with Honeywell as well. Uh, just keep in mind you still have to run power even though you do have wireless. So you do have some cable runs that you will be dealing with. At least at this point in the future, or at this point in time. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully they're underground. <laughs> okay, so one more question and then we'll we'll wrap up. It says, does Honeywell offer fire and gas detector mapping currently with their devices and projects? Or is a separate company such as Connexus needed to be called a pull-in besides Honeywell on a typical project? The way it stands today, we would have to use third party like Connexus. But give it a few weeks. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for um, volunteering your time and, and going through these presentations. Um, and we'll talk soon, so thank you guys again. All right, thanks, okay, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Cheers.